Anita Berg had no idea about her husband's double life. I realized something was wrong that same day when I couldn't get hold of him. He said that he was, he was going to do one more errand for the Norwegian military intelligence in Moscow. Two weeks later, he disappeared. Now others in this border town have claimed agents tried to recruit them too. How many times did the Norwegian intelligence agency approach you? Maybe close to 10 times. The story has shaken a community proud of its friendship with Russia. Now Kirkenes is known as Norway's spy town. Anita Berg is battling to put a brave face on things, but she's devastated. In northern Norway, she tells me how, in December 2017, she saw her husband off to Moscow to meet friends. Then he vanished. Three frantic days later, she learned he'd been arrested as a spy. In a Moscow court, Frudeberg eventually confessed that he'd been working as a courier for Norwegian military intelligence. He's been sentenced to 14 years. The ones I'm truly angry at are Norwegian intelligence. They should have taken one of their own. But they took him, and they've broken him, and also broken a whole family. Frode Berg was employed by this border commission in Kirkenes for many years, and he was a frequent traveller to Russia. It started in 1970. It was after he retired, though, that he agreed to deliver envelopes of cash and instructions to a Russian source for Norwegian intelligence. It seems they wanted data on Russia's atomic submarines. Frodebeck did confide in one person. Trina tells me that she knew of secret calls and meetings in Oslo and that her friend felt under pressure to be a patriot. He had told him he didn't want to, but they really had let him understand that it was important. And they had asked him several times if he did not want to be a good Norwegian. Uh, people in Kirkenes think that they should not be asked to do these favours, exactly because we're on the bridge to Russia. Kirkenes has been forging good relations with its Russian neighbours ever since the USSR fell apart. But this remote borderland is clearly sensitive territory for both sides, especially as political and military friction has grown again. That's easy to see over in Russia. This whole route up here in the far north of Russia is a mixture of this really quite beautiful, rugged landscape and military installations. There's bases, there are military trucks, all just a reminder that we're not only on the border of Russia and Norway, but Russia and NATO as well. Even so, that border is still open for local residents to cross without a visa. So whilst Russians head to Kirkenes for the shops, Norwegians flood the other way for cheap fuel. Yeah, it's under half the price. So it makes it worth coming yes, here? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Lots of people do it. And do you have any Russian friends at all? No, not at all. You've never spoken to any Russians? No. Only the cashier. Nikol is Russia's version of Kirkenes, a short drive across the border. It's run down Twin Town. They're just as keen on cooperation here, though. Their wealthier neighbours are helping to clean up these emissions. And Norwegian cash even helped build the only church in Nikol. The latest plan is for an art object to celebrate years of friendship. Cheers for the cooperation. Tatiana refuses to let suspicion cloud all this, even though her last project with Frode Berg was cut short when he was arrested. You find a lot of this kind of thing up here too. Norwegians singing classic Russian rock, making music and winning friends in Russia. And it seems to work. They call it balalaika diplomacy, and Frode Berg was one of its key ambassadors. That's one reason his arrest was such a shock. Next morning, when the Norwegians head back across the border, they've got a Russian reggae band on board. The language gap means there's not much interaction on the tour bus, but there is a friendly mood. 
The politicians are doing their thing, but we are living here, so we have to get along. There is no other way. The political situation is still difficult, but, but things are happening all the time despite of this. So uh, we are not giving up. Beyond this border zone, though, east-west relations have really soured. Back in Kirkenes, there are fears that pressure on their way of doing things is rising. This place is weird. It's nearly the middle of the night and it's still light here, like daytime. And it's a really small community too, a tiny town. It's hard to imagine how anyone kept such big secrets here. And yet there was a really murky spy drama right here in Kirkenes. All sorts of things have since come to light in this eerie land of the midnight sun. Other civilians who say they were approached to spy in Russia, as in Oslo, concerns about an increasingly aggressive neighbour grew. Businessman Atla Berg believes that's why he was detained in Russia and accused of spying. He tells me Russia's FSB knew that Norwegian intelligence had tried to recruit him, just like Frode Berg. They came to my home place several times and tried to engage me. But I denied. I said no. And I said again and again and again the same. What did they say they wanted? They were not so precise. Just information, what has happened, what do you see, blah, blah, blah. Norway's intelligence agency didn't want to comment to me on any of this. The cultural diplomacy hasn't stopped. And in Kirkenes, it's concert time at the Ritz. The Russians turn to impress now with what they call the northernmost reggae in the world. Artists in the Arctic trying to drown out the hostility of their capitals. I've never been there. I don't know anything about Russia. But from now on, I like the music. <laughs> Norway's government says only that it wants to see Frode Berg return home here. It won't comment on the talks underway for that. And caught in the middle of it all is Frode Berg's family. Anita describes a life on hold, waiting for rare calls from a Russian prison. It's tough, it's exhausting, and it doesn't get easier. You just get more and more exhausted. What do you want them to do? <laughs> <laughs> everything. The government should do everything they can, and they should do it fast. Her great hope now is that Russia's president will pardon her husband, perhaps agree to a prisoner swap. Her great fear that any political deal in this climate will be painfully slow.